Um, I'm going to share some of my stories of the last 10 years, um, which really began for me when 10 years ago I was a thousand miles from anywhere in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And I dove off the bow of our boat into this amazing blue clear water. But when I surfaced, I realized that there were fragments of plastic in my eye line all around me. And it was that moment for me when everything changed and it's completely changed the course of what was to come. I was on that boat in the middle of the Pacific because although I trained as an architect, um, I fell in love with this idea of traveling slowly around our planet. And I wanted to get to my first job as an architect in Australia without taking an aeroplane. And when I jumped on Google to look at ways to hitchhike from England to Australia, this just popped up on my screen. And this boat's called Earthrace. It holds the round the world speed record. It went around the world in 60 days. But it did it running on 100% biofuel from all sorts of renewable sources. So this boat was about to go around the world for a second time to visit 120 cities to talk to schools, politicians, and the media about renewable energy. So I wrote to the skipper and said, how do I get a job on board your boat? And he said, come and meet us in Brighton for the weekend and we'll see how you get on. So I showed up in Brighton uh, with enough stuff to last me for a weekend and didn't end up going home for another 923 days. <laughs> so this boat was my ticket to Australia, but it ended up triggering an entirely new career that I was never expecting. Um, and the inside of Earthrace, she's not quite as glamorous as her sleek silver exterior might make you think. And this was home for the first year of those three years that I was away. I shared this little space with three smelly Kiwi boys. And we'd often have journalists come and visit the boat. And I remember this one Australian lady who came and climbed on board the boat and had to sort of lower herself in down the back hatch. And she dropped down beside me and she turned to me and said, how do you survive living in this little capsule? Don't you get so claustrophobic? But I remember thinking at the time, having grown up in the same house my whole life, gone to school, to university, suddenly I was on board this rocket ship powerboat taking off around the world with a group of people who thought in a completely different way to anyone I'd ever met. And I remember thinking it was about the most open-minded space I could have ever imagined. And we had the most incredible voyage around the world, but there were also the things that I was never expecting to see, like that moment I jumped in that Pacific Ocean, and then also stopping on these small islands and finding that locals were struggling to catch fish because the commercial vessels had emptied their waters of the fish that they knew how to catch. They were struggling to grow food in the ground because sea level rise had caused their soil to become too salty for their crops to grow. But the knock-on effect of this was a new reliance on importing packaged food and drink that all arrived by ship wrapped up in this new strange material, this plastic. In between each of these islands, we had days, weeks, months of this open ocean. And we'd sit on the roof of Earthrace and we'd stare out at the curvature of the earth on the horizon. And it was out here for me that things really started to change. One of the things I love about being at sea is how you're constantly reacting to the changes in the environment around you. So if the waves change direction or the wind picks up, you have to respond, you have to adjust your course, you have to change your sails, and often your life depends on your response. So at this point, I realized that I too needed to shift my course, my career. And instead of going to be an architect, it was plastic, which was the thing I decided I wanted to act on instead. Every island that we visited, every beach that I walked on, 
I was finding this plastic instead of sand. So after Earth Race, I went back to this little island in Tonga, one that we passed through on the way, a tiny island in the remote archipelago of the Kingdom of Tonga. It looks like absolute paradise from here, amazing turquoise ocean and white sandy beaches. But down on the ground, it really is a different story. So the local community here, who are now almost forced to import their food packaged, end up with nowhere for that waste to go. There's no landfill, there's no proper incineration. It gets dumped in the ocean, on the beach, or burnt. And it was actually the burning of plastic, that really distinctive, toxic smell that kept getting up my nose on all of these islands. And so I started to find out, what is it that I was smelling? What are those chemicals that are being released? And that's when I learned about dioxins, chemicals that lead to cancer and also disrupt our hormone systems, really things that we don't want inside us. And the kids living on this island certainly don't either. So I ended up spending six months working with the local schools and the community on a system. But what I realized when I started to learn the Tongan language is that there wasn't actually a word for rubbish or bin. That concept of throwing something away into a controlled system didn't even exist in their culture. Because up until recently, it hadn't needed to. A banana peel, a coconut husk could be thrown on the ground, no problem. So it wasn't only infrastructure that these little islands needed, but a whole new way of thinking about this new inorganic material. So at the end of these six months, we culminated in an enormous cleanup event. We had 3,000 people, which was three quarters of the whole population. And together, we picked up 56 tons of rubbish in just five hours. Enough to fill this auditorium a couple of times over. It took us several weeks to clean and sort and package that waste into 3,000 rubbish sacks so it could get taken away, some to a safe landfill site, and what could be recycled was. Now, this amount of waste on these two tiny islands in Tonga just absolutely staggered me. But not only the waste that was domestic coming from the community themselves, but also the waste that I was seeing every morning when I walked along the beach, I was seeing plastic washing up, often with writing on the labels that I didn't even recognize. So this got me asking more questions. Where was that plastic coming from? And how was it traveling thousands of miles around the world to end up on this little beach in Tonga? So at this point, I started to learn more about the way that we actually use plastic um, here's some of what I found out. Uh, so this terrifyingly large number, <laughs> running really, really quickly, is the number of bags that we're using right now in this world. And this started counting on the 1st of January, 2018. Now, all those bags, they get used once, maybe twice, probably three times at best, and then they're thrown away. And that's this thing about plastic. It's an amazing material that's designed to last forever. And we go and make things like plastic bags that are designed to be used once and then thrown out. And it's really that mismatch of material science and product design that puts us in this situation of having huge amounts of waste material that no longer have any use or any value. So then I thought, can't we recycle all of that plastic? Can't we turn it back into new things? But then I discovered that only 9% of the plastic that we use actually gets recycled. And that number's so low because plastic is a name that we give to all of these different materials that all have different properties and therefore different chemical structures. But if you want to recycle something, you can only take one type of plastic at a time to get a good quality product at the other end. So all this plastic with nowhere to go, much of it ends up going down the sewers, down drains, down rivers, and ultimately everything runs downhill to the ocean. So what we do know is that most of it's coming from land, 
and then it meets these ocean currents. So in our northern hemisphere, we have two clockwise rotating cl currents, and in the southern hemisphere, three anti-clockwise currents. And in the middle of those patches, the kind of really dense red patches here, it's really calm. And a meteorologist would call it the center of a high. And as scientists, we call this the center of a gyre. And it's the place where all of that plastic wants to go and end up. So this computer model that was produced in 2008 began to intrigue me. Um, and back then, when it was published, only the North Pacific had really been studied by scientists. But this was showing that actually it might be happening in another four parts of the world as well. So you guessed it, this became the next mission, to sail to those other four gyres and find out, is there any plastic there? And if so, how much? And ultimately, what are we going to do about it? So this new project called for a new boat. This is Sea Dragon. It was originally built to race around the world along with 10 sister ships. And it was designed to race in the wrong direction, going into the prevailing winds instead of with them. So the perfect boat really to get us to these really hard to get to remote parts of the planet. And we set off on the first of these journeys out to the South Atlantic. And we started to see plastic over the side of the boat. And we got our nets out and we started scooping things in. But by the end of day one, this is all we'd found. Now this really surprised us because we knew that eight million tons of plastic every year was going into the ocean. And yet this is all we were finding in supposedly the densest part. But it turned out that most of this plastic, once it gets into the ocean, it breaks down into these tiny fragments, what we call microplastics. They're smaller than your little fingernail. And this is breaking down from the UV rays of the sun and the wave actions. But the key here is that it's not biodegrading. It's not going back into the carbon cycle. It's simply getting smaller, harder to see, and much, much harder to try and clean up. So once we take samples of these pieces, we then put them under the microscope, we analyze them. Um, and what I couldn't believe here is that in these samples, it's almost impossible to tell the difference between these plastic pieces and the plankton that's all around them, the fish food that's also floating on the surface of our ocean. So then we start to catch fish and we find things like this rainbow runner that actually had 17 fragments of plastic that he'd mistaken for food inside his stomach. So at this point, our conversation really changed. We were no longer just focused on the physical impacts of plastic in these gyres, but if it's getting into the food chain, the same food chain that we are at the top of, then what might this mean chemically for us as well? So at this point, we had so many unanswered questions about whether or not this is something that we even need to worry about. So back in 2014, I decided to have my own blood tested for these chemicals that are either used in the production of plastic or other chemicals like pesticides and fluorinated compounds and flame retardants that are basically pollutants in our environment. So working with the United Nations, we picked 35 chemicals that are banned because they're toxic to humans. And of those 35 chemicals, we found 29 of them inside my body. Now, this really changed things for me. And I think often when we're hearing or reading in the news about some environmental problem, it's happening somewhere else that's affecting somebody else that might affect us in the future. But this made me realize that actually, already, I'm afraid we all have a chemical footprint, something that we will never get rid of. And at the moment, the levels aren't alarmingly high that we need to be concerned about our health, but it is a scary indicator of the direction that we're heading. So this exercise, doing this blood test, led to a whole new venture for me, X Expedition this series of women's voyages. And why women, you ask? 
when I started to find out what impact those chemicals I have inside me have on my body, I learned that most of them are endocrine disruptors. They mimic hormones. And as a woman, they can particularly affect me when in the future I hopefully get pregnant at some point. And when we give birth to our children and when we breastfeed and realizing that it was actually quite a women-centered issue, I thought, why not tackle it with an amazing team of women? So we brought together this team to sail across the North Atlantic in 2014 uh, to try and answer some of these questions about plastics and toxics and also about what we could do about it. And uh, here I am now, a few years later, having just finished our 11th voyage around the world. So uh, it was going to be a one-off voyage, the first one, but we've now run this whole series over the last few years. And what I want to share now is a little bit about the trip that I just got back from uh, in the North Pacific. So firstly, why did we choose the route that we did between Hawaii and Vancouver? So this is a model that kind of simulates the ocean currents in the North Pacific. Um, and as you can see, after that model's run for a while, um, all of the simulated pieces of debris end up in this region between about 20 and 40 degrees latitude north of the equator. And so by sailing from Hawaii to Vancouver, we could go through the real centre of the eastern part of this accumulation zone. Um, so we basically brought our whole team together um, in Hawaii to leave on this trip. Um, I've got now a series of short videos uh, that really show what we saw when we got to Hawaii just before we set off on this voyage. <laughs> Today we're on the east coast of Oahu and we're looking at what plastic is washing in. Oahu, one of the Hawaiian islands, really sits on the edge of the North Pacific gyre that we're going to be sailing to next week. Plastic on this beach, it literally could have come from anywhere across the Pacific. America, Canada, Asia, a lot of it is single-use plastic, a lot of containers. Right here we've got a toothbrush. We've got a couple of pieces here which are interesting. You'll actually see along here that there are some teeth marks. Today's been brilliant because it's the first day that our X Expedition North Pacific crew have all come together. The crew is made up from amazing women from all over the world. We have six different nationalities, but most importantly, a really diverse skill set. We have got journalists, artists, scientists, teachers, filmmakers, policymakers, and product designers. So people who can both look at the challenge, share that message, and also think about solving it. So we brought this amazing team together and we posed for our very important sponsor pictures and we got our, all of our sampling equipment on board and we got completely ready to go with this amazing team of women that brought all these different skills to the project. You might have noticed we didn't really talk about many of them being sailors. <laughs> Um, to get to the gyre, this real, real calm patch, we actually first had to go into the trade winds, um, which were blowing pretty strong in June. Um, so there wasn't really any footage from the first 48 hours of the voyage, um, but here's a little wrap up 48 hours in of what had gone down. In the last 48 hours, we've had wind waves. Rocking and a rolling. The food has been delicious. Eaten a lot, slept a lot and helmed a lot. Very wavy conditions last night. Gusted up to 40 knots. In a squall in the middle of the night. Full moon and stars. I've never been so afraid of drinking water. Not being sick, being sick. More sick than expected. Grew up in the wrong direction and got sick on my forehead. Challenges of trying to cook noodles at a 45 degree angle. I'm trying to use a little bit of 45 degree angle. I think I've seen a turtle. I managed to cook some lunch in my underwear. I'm singing Fleetwood Mac up to my lungs. I really enjoy everyone here and their company makes me a kind of a release about that sickness. It's been wonderful. And we're almost heading in the right direction for the gyre. <laughs> so we're lucky enough to have two stars of that film in the audience with us today. Uh, you can meet Sally later, see if she's still got any sick on her forehead. <laughs> <laughs> so the first couple of days, I mean about the first five days actually, um, were pretty hard going as we all learned how to live together on board this boat that was really bumpy and at the wrong angle. Um, and there was a lot of humour involved in kind of getting us through the, the vomit stage of the trip. Um, but then on day six we woke up and we looked over the side of the boat and we started seeing pieces of plastic. We've been sailing through the North Pacific Gyre for seven days. 
and we can't believe what we've seen. Plastic bottles, these brushes, plastic bags, buckets and barrels. A lot of rope, more pieces of rope, nylon rope. A constant stream of small bits of plastic. A cigarette lighter, fishing crates. Micro, micro, micro plastic. We saw one huge fishing net tied up together. Seeing these beautiful dolphins and then chunks of plastic next to them. It's the sheer amount of pieces. It's literally a plastic soup. Large plastic lids for containers. A washing basket. Half a toilet seat. We saw a chair with all four legs. All these items once belonged to someone and they definitely don't belong in the ocean. So uh, that piece of debris that you saw floating around there, you can see on the screen now, um, this was one of the larger pieces that we came across. Um, and this is the one big myth that we're trying to bust here is that it's not an island. Um, uh, the next piece, I go into the microplastics, but we did find this one slightly bigger piece that was a bit like an iceberg. It was about 10 times as big by the time we looked underneath than it was on the surface and tangled up a whole load of plastic bottles and containers within it. Um, but here we're basically attaching a satellite tracker uh, so that the scientists that we're working with at NASA can understand where this debris is moving once it gets into the gyre. And, um, and actually be able to go out and clean it up um, in the next couple of months. But also to learn about the invasive species that are potentially being carried with this piece of debris. Because one of the things that happens here is you get the algae comes and kind of starts to live on the plastic. And then the small fish come along. And then the slightly bigger fish come along. Um, and then actually the even bigger fish come along. So Anna jumped in behind me on shark watch, looking down. Don't know what she was going to do if she did see a shark. Um, but... But this is the thing, they do attract a whole ecosystem that then moves across the ocean as well. Uh, so, so many other unseen consequences of having this debris in our ocean. And now the next bit, um, I've got one more short video, um, which is going to really talk about the microplastic side of the research that we were doing. Oh. We're in the very middle of the North Pacific Gyre and when we look out at sea it looks like a beautiful blue ocean. It's only when we put this trawl through the water with a very fine mesh net do we realise that actually most of what we're looking at right now is covered in these tiny fragments. We deploy the trawl for 30 minutes at a time and we're taking a tiny slice just this wide for a mile, which just makes you wonder really how many are out here in this vast ocean. The samples we're collecting on board are gonna be used for a number of things. Some will go back to Hawaii Pacific University to be analyzed for the toxic chemicals that are adhering to the surface of the plastic. The rest of the samples are being analyzed right here on board Sea Dragon. We're looking at pellet, fragment, film, line, and foam. Once we work out what these plastics are, we can better understand where they're coming from and how to stop them getting into the ocean. And then in addition to the science, we also spend quite a lot of time on board having conversation, talking about both what we're seeing, but also as we moved into that last third of the expedition, um, building the optimism. You know, what is it that we can do about this and what's going to happen when we get back to land? We were mapping out the solutions from the ocean all the way up to the source, which is where they really begin. And all of us conclude, um, particularly this kind of very um, ceremonious kind of moment, you know, when you finally reach land on one of these voyages, that actually the place that we need to be working is not in the ocean on cleanup but on land, working at the source and trying to turn off this tap of plastic. So when it comes to this and kind of what we can all do, um, I think most of us in the room, particularly uh, if you're, you're mostly probably UK based, you know, the UK has been going mad for plastic in the last year, which has been an amazing kind of shift in consciousness around this issue. And so we've all, we all kind of know what it is that we can do on a personal level in terms of reducing our own plastic consumption, turning off our own plastic tap so that it's not um, going out there, but it's also just not being used in the first place. All those water bottles, plastic bags, coffee cups, straws, things that we can ultimately all do without. But the question that I really put to our team when we were out there is how do you take your impact to the next level? And the question I often ask is, what is your superpower? What is the thing that makes you brilliant and you unique? So on board, we had a filmmaker, we had a packaging designer, we had a teacher. They all have these incredible skills to kind of bring to the problem. And then it's a case of trying to work out 
where does my superpower intersect the issue of plastic? Or if there's something else that you're passionate about, where does it intersect that? And then how do you turn that into a project that's going to create real impact? So when we left uh, the boat, this is what some of our crew had to say. We've got an amazing team of women on board from all around the world, but most importantly, different skills who approach this plastics problem from every angle. My superpower is visually communicating, telling people about what we've seen um, and having that personal connection. I'm very fortunate to be working with a company that is providing one of the best solutions to make sure plastic bottles are given a value so they can stay in the loop. I'm a sea turtle biologist and researcher and I'm going to aid in understanding the impact of plastic pollution through my work. I plan to use video as a way of telling the stories about the people and businesses that are leading the charge in the fight against marine plastic pollution. I'm a designer. I will tell this amazing story to put together a group of people and make them to think together. My superpower is finding 101 different ways to tell people about plastic and what their own superpowers can be. I'm an educator and I plan to start talking to kids about what we have seen, also about what we have to do. I really like helping people and I I think this problem will affect a lot of people. When I get back to Slovenia, I'm gonna share this experience. I'm a marine scientist, so my skills lie in research, but I'm also really passionate about communicating science in popular culture through the arts. I'm an educator and I see the value in education as acting as the bridge between the scientific research and knowledge and people and the actions that they can take and the solutions that we can generate. It's been an incredible voyage. We've had so much sharing and so much learning from one another. I'm really looking forward to what happens next when we go back home to affect change in whatever sphere of influence that we all have available to us so that we can tackle this ocean plastic problem. And what I realise is that actually what we need is an army of people. There is no silver bullet for this issue of plastic. There's no one answer that I can say, just do this and it's all solved. But the good news is there's so many things that we can be doing to approach it from all these different directions. Um, I'm going to leave it there. Um, I wish you all a, a wonderful afternoon getting to know amazing other adventurers and explorers in the room and thinking about the adventures you're going to have that can hopefully make a real impact. Thank you.